It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. My guest today is Rick Phillips, president and CEO of LK Manufacturing. Rick has deep experience developing strategy, driving execution, negotiating mergers, and positively impacting organizational culture. LK is a family-owned middle market company that is a leading manufacturer of world-class stainless steel and quartz sinks, in addition to drinking fountains, smart well water delivery systems, and the award-winning easy H2O bottle filling stations that you see at airports around the globe. Rick is building a long-term corporate strategy and prioritizing focus and investment. He is leading the senior management team in efforts to grow the business by commercializing innovations, expanding global presence, executing on acquisition opportunities, and maximizing shareholder return through enhancements in revenue, profitability, and growth. Prior to his role at LK, Rick was CEO at Ascendant and was a partner with McKinsey & Company before that. There, Rick led more than 60 engagements across the globe with healthcare and consumer businesses, ranging from a billion to $100 billion in annual sales. Rick began his career with Baxter Healthcare and earned a Master of Management from the Kellogg School and achieved a Bachelor of Science and Finance from Indiana University. Rick Phillips, welcome into the corner office. Thanks so much, Brent. It's great to be with you today. Well, it's great to hear you as well. We we spoke a couple of months ago uh, and uh, getting into the Christmas season here. This is, of course, coming out uh, sometime in 2022 and some days ahead of us, but uh, great to hear that you're doing well and enjoying your time there and, and still in the Chicago area, right? You're, you're, you're living there as well as working there, as I understand it. That's right. Our offices are located in Downers Grove, which is a western suburb of, uh, of Chicago. And fortunately for me, uh, I only live about 10 or 15 minutes from the office in nice. uh, town nice. in Hinsdale. So uh, the commute is, uh, is, is treat me just fine. That's easy. Great. Well, we always like to kind of start in the beginning and, uh, would love to hear a little bit about your early days. Tell us about, you know, where you grew up and what your early family life was like. Sure, Brant. Um, well, I had a, really had a great, uh, childhood. Uh, it was a, unusual in that, uh, I actually moved about 15 times oh my goodness. Uh, before, before I graduated from high school. So, uh, my father worked in, uh, in business. He, he worked in retail and oh. there were a number of, uh, of promotions and changes, uh, that caused us to relocate. So, yeah, uh, so yeah. that made it interesting. I was, what, the, com- uh, what company was he with, Rick? Uh, he spent a, a number of years with Target. Uh, Target, okay, good, uh, and, great. You know, there was great. district manager, region manager, you know, whatever it was. Each and sure. in those days, each one of those new roles was uh, was typically a relocation. So, right. uh, but I'm right. the I'm the oldest of uh, of four children, and uh, you know, I will say that uh, those moves really brought us closer together, and we've remained yeah. uh, really close throughout our lives. Because I guess. Uh, uh, in the midst of making new friends, after all these moves, uh, what you had was your was your siblings. That's right, so, your uh, core we, family. Yeah, we really yeah. spent a lot of great uh, family time together uh, in those days. Mom worked from the home. I, I'm sure with four four kids, five kids in total. There was a or or is it four kids in total? Four in total. <laughs> four in total. She was yes. pretty busy with bringing you folks up. Did she go back into the workforce or start there? She did go back into the workforce. So mm-hmm. she she spent uh, you know most of my childhood uh, working from home and, and raising the kids, as you said. And then uh, she actually uh, worked her way up to become an executive director at a YMCA. Oh, uh, cool! Which was a, a passion of hers, yeah. and, uh, and worked for you know for the next many years as the as the kids got older. 
Fantastic. What are some of your earliest memories of, you know, some of the mentoring that mom and dad did as you were growing up? I mean, certainly as the oldest, uh, I know that in my family, my, my oldest son always complains, dad, you, you learned all our strategies on us and, or on me. And you give, you know, my younger siblings it's so much of an easier time. Was that kind of your experience as well? Or were you all treated pretty fairly? <laughs> Yeah, I think we were we were certainly treated fairly. I guess uh, one of the the uh, great memories uh, that I had was just spending time talking with my dad about business for mm, whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, I had an interest in business from a young age, and I would love it when he would come home from trips, and you know, I would just ask him, you know, what'd you do this week, and you know, right. who did you work with, and um, I, I just enjoyed learning uh, that way, and we really you know continued that um, you know throughout many years yeah. afterwards. And Target's such a great organization. Wow, what a wonderful organization to get trained in and grow up in retail. You know, such an important part of our economy. Any other early influencers, uh, Rick, you know, coaches or teachers that had an impact on you in those early days? Yes. I, you know, I, I was uh, active in athletics, uh, primarily yeah. uh, baseball and basketball, which nice. I played, um, you know, all up through my high school years. And uh, I did have a, a couple of basketball coaches that uh, just really made an impression on me with, um, you know, how they would inspire you to uh, ensure that you had the discipline, the teamwork. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I really felt like I've taken a lot of uh, lessons from athletics into my business career and, and my life more broadly uh, based yeah. on that. So that was uh, always uh, exciting times as a kid. And, and again, uh, I feel like benefits really throughout your life. What was your position in basketball? I was a point guard. Um, okay. That was really right. the only option uh, because I'm uh, <laughs> about six feet tall and uh, there was uh, no one else uh, was, uh, I wasn't playing any other positions at six feet. That's for sure. Right. Right. Cool. Were you a good student in school, secondary school and elementary? I was. I, I uh, my my parents definitely uh, taught all of us uh, to to take school very seriously, and and uh, you know I did. Uh, given the interest in business, I was certainly thinking about uh, attending college in the future, mm. and, and knew uh, that obviously uh, that was all going to be important. So uh, so I did. I, I tried to stay focused on my studies and and uh, you know be ready for that next step going to college. Awesome. Awesome. What about entrepreneurial things? Uh, you do it with their, you know, the, the neighborhood paper route. Did you get, you know, into selling Christmas cards at, at Christmas time or other types of things to raise spending money? I would just say uh, mowing lawns uh, yeah, was, was right. definitely, uh, you know, something that was uh, required of me at my house, of course. But uh, <laughs> Of course. But I, that was room and board, right? <laughs> that's right. But I decided to, you know, use the lawnmower to try to uh, earn some money elsewhere. Uh, so I, I did some of that. And certainly uh, during the time that we lived in uh colder climates, I would, uh, shovel snow in the winter sure. as well. Right. I'd yeah. walk, walk around the neighborhood, knocking on some doors and, uh, try to make a few extra dollars. Were you expected to save money for college or was it pretty much you're spending money your own during those days? Mostly my own spending money. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, told that there would be some expectation, uh, not for paying tuition or, uh, or living expenses, but, uh, um, you know, for yeah. books and, right. you know, right. my own spending money while at college. So I, I did, um, you know, I was very fortunate and blessed that my parents provided the education for me, but I, I needed to save at least a little bit, uh, to help me, uh, get right. by at school. Right. What about, um, you know, kind of some of the earlier part-time jobs. Did you have some during high school and college years? I did. Uh, in high school, I was uh, a summer lifeguard, um, oh, cool. uh, which, you know, worked out well. And I was at a, a pretty large facility where, uh, you know, there were many people my age from different schools. So it was, it was also kind of a, a fun social uh, opportunity as well. But I, uh, I was a lifeguard in high school. And then I was fortunate to uh, have some internships uh, when I was in college. So I, I spent the summers, uh, you know, trying to get ready for my career that way. Yeah, cool. Well, you went to Indiana University. Was was that a, were you living in Indiana at the time? Or were you, were you already in the Chicago area when you decided to go there? I uh, had had gone to three of my four years of high school uh, outside of Indianapolis, okay. and so I got right. to know Indiana during that time, and so yeah. that was uh, very much the connection. I was a, a fan of the basketball team, and you know sure. I knew people from my school who had attended Indiana, so uh, so there was you know some connection for me that uh, drew me to the school, and I knew that they also had a reputation for a a good undergraduate business school. And of course, that's uh, what I knew I wanted to major in. Yeah. Awesome. So you, you got a, a Bachelor of Science in Finance, I believe. And then what was that first job you took outside of college? Right? I, I went uh, and joined a uh, corporate finance uh, leadership rotational program oh. at Baxter Healthcare. 
which okay. is uh, located up north of Chicago. And yeah. uh, it was really a great experience. I, you know, I, one of the themes um, as I uh, thought about things at the time was obviously as, uh, you know, a young uh, person entering the workforce, there's just so much in business to learn uh, that you hadn't yet had exposure to. And so the idea of a rotational program where, you know, every four to six months, you'd go into a different business, into a different right. function, would just be a way to try to accelerate exposure to, to different businesses and functions and people and leadership styles. And so, uh, so I was excited about the company and, and how it was growing and, uh, the opportunity that, uh, that that provided. And it, it did, it, it, it was, uh, showed you what you liked, you know, in some cases, what you had a stronger interest in for the future and, right. and maybe areas you didn't want to go into the future, but all that was part of the, the learning process. Now, did you, did you, uh, you started finance in, in college. Was that, you know, kind of uh, what you had an inkling for in the beginning? Did you take a couple of different courses? How'd you kind of settle into that as, as coursework? And then obviously, uh, in, into the first jobs that you took. Yeah, I, I'd say it was a little bit of, uh, getting exposed to different, uh, topics. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I found that I was not probably going to go the accounting uh, way, which was right. a, a very popular uh, major there. And of course, took accounting classes, but I, I didn't think that that path was what I wanted. Uh, I did like marketing as well and, and finance. And so that's where I ended up focusing uh, most of my uh, business courses and, uh, over time. And uh, also thought that, uh, you know, in the spirit of, uh, of being broad, uh, trying to learn broadly that, uh, there was a lot of avenues with a finance degree that you could go right. into. Um, and, and that yeah. was, uh, you know, something that was attractive to me. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, I assume you started managing people at Baxter. Was that the first time you, you, you became a leader? It was, uh, I'd yeah. say at the conclusion of that, uh, rotational program after a couple years at the company, uh, I think is when I started managing and, uh, I really enjoyed it. It, it felt natural. Um, I had really tried to learn from, uh, you know, a lot of good managers that in my early career I'd come right. into contact with and, uh, tried to, you know, put in place, uh, some of those things in terms of, uh, you know, trying to be a good coach, but, um, providing direction and at the same time, uh, giving people the space, uh, to do their jobs and to, right. to learn on their own. And so those were the, uh, those were the bosses that I most like working with at that sure. point. And, and so I, I tried to, uh, learn from that and, and pass some of that on. What were some of the challenges that you might've had in those early days of managing people? I, I know we're going back a couple of decades, but, uh, do you remember the, in those early days first having folks and, and were they folks that were, you know, about your same age or were they older? You know, what was kind of the culture there when you, you know, began, uh, in, in your management, uh, uh, direction? I'd, you know, I'd say close to the same age, um, in those yeah. days, um, for the most part. And, um, you know, I think it was, uh, the, the challenge was really just kind of getting to know each other's styles. Um, right. you know, there were, uh, I can remember a time when I had was managing two or three people and, and one just, you know, really wanted intense, uh, direction and, um, you know, sought that out several times a day. Uh, and you know, someone else uh, would, would love to spend a half hour with you understanding, uh, the expectations and then, you know, go off and execute on their own for a while, uh, right. and come back when they right. need help. And, you know, either of those styles can work, but I think it was, um, uh, seeing what would be most effective for different people, uh, based on where they're at in their careers and, and based on their, uh, learning styles. So, I, you know, that was, that was something that, uh, I learned quickly, that, you know, treating everyone exactly the same, uh, mm. when people had different styles was probably yeah. not going to be effective. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny. It's exactly the same thing that I did. You know, you, you kind of, you think a cookie cutter approach is going to work on us and well, you know, she didn't really respond the same way he did. <laughs> Maybe I need to try to find something else. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And you went on to McKinsey, spent about 15 years there. Tell, tell us about kind of the decision process there. Baxter, you know, being a great company, I'm sure you had a lot of opportunities there, but, you know, it took a little bit of a pivot into consulting. What was, uh, what were some of your reasons for doing that at that time? You know, I, um, I really, for the first time became, uh, much more aware of an understanding of management consulting, uh, when I was at business school. Right at Northwestern. And, you know, a lot of people had come from that background. Many others were seeking to go in that direction. And so, uh, I learned a lot really from, from fellow students at the time. And, uh, what I, 
you know, and you, was, you did your master's while you were at Baxter, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yep. I went in, uh, in the evenings and, uh, so that was, you know, obviously a busy time, but, uh, I really was enjoying what I was doing at Baxter. I didn't really want to, uh, walk away from that, uh, sure. to go to school full time. And, um, and so, you know, it was, a, it was something to balance, but I, I, I really enjoyed, uh, doing it that way and, and, you know, felt like, again, they kept, kept the learning going. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, you know, I guess I'd say from a career standpoint, at, at that point, I had in mind that I, I would be interested in, you know, a general manager kind of opportunity mm-hmm. uh, at some point in the future. And uh, the more I got to know about consulting, the more I felt like that would really provide uh, great training for doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. what I understood about it, and it certainly turned out to be the case, you know, you got to work with uh, a lot of really great clients uh, at different companies. And so you see different styles and, and ways of leading and inspiring people. Uh, you know, you work on challenging topics uh, at mm-hmm. those clients and, and working with some some great people in order to try to come together as a team and solve those. And, and the pace tends to be uh, pretty rapid. Um, and, sure. you know, these are challenging topics and, uh, you know, companies that are very focused on moving forward. And so, um, you know, there was, there was a pace to that, that I, that attracted me just in terms of, uh, again, the kind of the speed of, of, uh, of learning and preparing yourself mm-hmm. for the future. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I probably didn't expect to stay at McKinsey as long as I did, um, you know, knowing that I had this longer term general management interest, but, uh, but I, I just, I truly did enjoy it and, and there and were the great opportunities and, yeah. uh, had the opportunity to, uh, you know, be part of kind of starting a practice and, uh, over time, many people joining that practice. And, and so it was just, it was exciting time to work together, uh, with teammates and colleagues and learn and, and have positive impact. And, uh, and so I really, uh, was drawn to it probably for, uh, you know, a longer period of time than I, I probably would have yeah. guessed coming in. Now, when you started as an associate there, and I know you eventually became a partner, did, did you have people responsibility or, or you go straight into consulting and you're more of an individual contributor in those early days? Yeah, I'd say it's more the latter in the yeah. early days. Um, and so typically somewhere in the, uh, and it varies, but typically somewhere in the two to three years after joining uh, might be the time for uh, a manager role, in which right. case, you know, you'd be kind of leading the day-to-day project and have a team of maybe three or four people. Uh, but typically in the early days, it's, uh, it is more of a, you're part of that team, but you're not managing. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, did you specialize in a few different industries or did they kind of work you across the gamut? Yeah. Over time, um, you know, I, over the course of my career, I, I got exposure to a a whole lot of industries and, and functions that so over yeah. time, uh, I gravitated more toward healthcare, uh, yeah. from a industry standpoint and more toward, uh, operations, um, uh, from a functional standpoint. So again, a, a mix of, of work across, uh, industries and, uh, and functions, but that was sort of my concentration in my uh, later years at McKinsey. Yeah. Awesome. Then you went on to Ascendant and, uh, had your first C-suite role, right? Uh, came in as president and then eventually CEO there. Uh, tell us a little bit about kind of that transition and, you know, again, 15 years, lo- long time at McKinsey for obvious reasons. They, they liked you and you obviously liked them as well, but, uh, you know, kind of some serious with some of your thinking behind making that shift and, you know, the, 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 the desire or, or perhaps the drive, you know, to go and, you know, run a, a company on your own. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think the, um, the years at McKinsey really helped shape that in a lot of ways. Mm. Certainly, I learned an awful lot from the clients I worked with. Um, some of those I had the chance to work with for years. Uh, and so just seeing how they <clears throat> handled challenges and, and grew and developed and led, uh, you know, was something that uh, I learned an awful lot from. And I started to get excited about uh, the opportunity to, to really own um, you know, own your decisions for a longer yeah. period of time and, and, uh, and try to, you know, demonstrate and achieve the, uh, the longer term impact of the results, um, of, uh, of the company. So, so that I'd say was a big source of, of the interest to, to make the transition. And then I also certainly learned from, uh, many of my colleagues at McKinsey who had also made transitions, right. um, into working in companies. And I, I spent a lot of time, uh, asking them about their transition and how did they think about it and, you know, what was, what translated well and what didn't translate as well. So I, I really benefited from some great mentors. And in fact, the, um, 
the CEO at uh, Ascendant, uh, which at, at the time when I joined was actually called United Stationers before a, a brand change a couple of years later, right. uh, was a colleague of mine who I had worked with extensively at McKinsey. Okay, so, got it. Um, yeah. So that really was a, uh, you know, I, I felt like I, I was uh, following someone who had, had made a similar transition, who sure. kind of understood the challenges that I'd be facing and, and was willing to help me uh, address those. So, so yeah, it, as you said, I started as the, the president of the online business. Right. Um, I eventually uh, became uh, moved over and uh, became president of the industrial businesses. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, uh, eventually became CEO. Yeah, great. And that leads us to LK, where obviously you are today and very different business. Uh, so a bit of a pivot from an industry standpoint. Tell us a little bit about the thought process you went through as you made that change. Sure. Um, well, the first part of the change was that um, during the time I was CEO at Ascendant, uh, we were the, lots of changes in the industry. Um, had some had some fascinating experiences. We um, uh, we did engineer a bit of a turnaround, um, given some of the, the pressures that we had in the industry. We did negotiate and announce uh, a major merger uh, mm. with uh, with a competitor. We ended up not closing on that merger because. Um, the private equity firm that owns Staples uh, approached us and, and uh, you know, Staples was a large customer of ours. We knew them well. They knew us yeah. well. And mm-hmm. eventually, um, you know, our, our board decided that it was best to sell the company uh, to Staples. And so mm-hmm. uh, so that's the point where I transitioned uh, yeah. from Ascendant. And, uh, you know, the, the transition to LK was, you know, I really looked at uh, two things were kind of most important to me. I did want to be a CEO again. Uh, so I, that was the role I was looking for. And I, right. I wanted a place that had a great culture. Um, mm. I, I just saw from all of my experiences, especially in consulting, where you see so many different companies, uh, right. just how important that culture uh, was to me. And if it was, yeah. you know, collaborative and, and high expectations for integrity and, and transparent and, you know, those things really uh, made a big difference to me. So that was that was one area that I, I really tried to explore. And then the other one was just the level of business opportunity. You know, how much were we well positioned in the market for growth? Um, you know, would I truly have the opportunity to to form and lead a team uh, toward a high aspiration? And uh, mm-hmm. and those things I felt like were very much um, in place at LK and, and, and certainly turned out to be the case. Yeah. Now, it started as a family business, I believe, back in the 1920s, wasn't it? 1915, 1920s when it was founded? That's right. Last year, we actually celebrated our 100 year anniversary. <laughs> yeah, and it is it is family owned private yeah. company. And, and yeah. so, um, you know, there's a lot of aspects of that that really make it uh, a special place yeah. uh, the, you know, the values are, uh, are really paramount and, and uh, they don't change. Uh, you know, they've, they've been uh, something that's really important to leaders for a long time. And uh, and, and there's always a long-term outlook on the business, which I really like. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been really a great experience and I've been fortunate to have a really, a really strong team, uh, around me and, and we've had a lot of fun working together. Yeah. Well, you know, as a family owned business and obviously privately held, we know there's not a lot of information that's typically shared, but maybe you just give us a little bit of a thumbnail sketch, uh, you know, the, the size of the business in terms of people and offices and, and, you know, your key mission and vision. Sure, absolutely. So there's, um, we have about three thousand employees wow. uh, worldwide. Probably the, the best way to describe it is there's really two major uh, parts of the business. Uh, the traditional one that we've been in for a hundred years is on uh, the water, uh, what we call the water or plumbing side of the business. That right. business primarily focuses on stainless steel sinks and also sinks of other materials yeah. uh, for manufacturing. And then uh, what- Senior what, name in many places. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then of course, what we're probably best known for now is uh, is the bottle fillers uh, that you see in uh, airports and, right. and schools yeah. and hospitals. Yeah. And, and of course, also tr- traditional drinking fountains. So right. uh, we're very much a leader uh, in those areas uh, on that side of the business as well, you know, as well as some other uh, products in water. And that's, that's, one part of the business, um, and that is primarily a U.S. business. We do have some yeah. uh, international there, but but it's fairly limited. The other side of the business is called LK Interior Systems, um, and that business focuses on designing and installing uh, commercial interiors uh, oh, for remodeling okay. projects. And the biggest customers there are McDonald's, uh, Starbucks, 
also we were in hospitality with Hyatt, Marriott, et cetera. So um, you could kind of think of us as sort of the general contractor of, uh, of a remodeling effort uh, when nice. say a hotel is going to you know spruce up their rooms. So we actually manufacture a lot of the products that go in the rooms, wow. uh, others we source, and then we partner uh, with those companies to on the actual design. Uh, and that business so fairly is, fairly big orders, right? So if they're you know building right. a thousand room hotel, then they would contract with you for you know the sinks or the you know faucets or whatever else that that might go into that location. Every, is that correct? Everything that would go into it. Yeah, I yeah. mean even oh. the um, the furniture. You know, again, some of it we make, some of it we we source, but right. uh, but that business is uh, is very global because of course all those those brands are global and, of course, and you yeah. know, they want to have partners, uh, across the globe. And, right. uh, so those are really the two, two sides to the business. And, uh, you know, we have been acquisitive over time, we continue to look for, uh, you know, those kinds of, uh, acquisition opportunities, uh, to, to grow on both sides, but we've really got nice, uh, organic growth, uh, in those businesses as well. And we feel like we're really well positioned given the trends on, uh, health and hydration and, right. uh, also conserving, um, you know, plastic, for example, uh, our bottle fillers, uh, have saved the equivalent of 37 billion, uh, plastic bottles. Uh, I, I love seeing those little counters, <laughs> right? Yeah, and every, in every airport you see that, you know, you saved, you know, this, this location saved over 4,000 4, bottles. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're really proud of that. And, yeah. and, uh, again, you know, feel like we're trying to play our role yeah. in, uh, in making the world a better place. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So th- give us a little compare and contrast, you know, Baxter, again, big publicly traded company, you got your start there. Not that you're at the end of your career, but, you know, obviously at the apex with a wonderful company and privately held, you know, a lot of our listeners, of course, you know, and in, in like yourself and myself started with, um, you know, large publicly traded companies kind of coming in and training, et cetera, and then eventually move into more middle market family companies. What, what's been some of the biggest differences for you, you know, both the likes and dislikes as, as you compare those, you know, those larger experiences with the Baxters of the world versus the LKs? Sure. No, it's a, it's a great question, Brant. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd say there's there is certainly a uh, there's a speed element, right? It, it's always there's always going to be more uh, policies and and mm. you know things that that need to be done and followed in a in a big public company um, right. from a decision making and execution standpoint uh, than maybe a middle market or private company. And so, yeah. uh, you know, the ability to uh, quickly align the organization around a direction uh, and begin executing it, um, I've found to be, you know, one of the differences that's really, uh, that's really fun. Um, yeah, yeah. I think the, you know, the opportunity as a leadership team to really put your stamp on the culture um, is also, uh, you know, something that's naturally going to be a lot easier to do with, uh, you know, fewer people uh, right, than, you know, sure. trying to implement that with 15 or 20,000 people. And so, right. uh, so that, that one also, I think it, you, you feel like your impact maybe can be uh, a little more quick. Uh, you know, sometimes also though, you know, a smaller, a, a larger company is going to have more resources. Um, sure. You know, you're going to be able to invest more in, yeah. in some yeah. of the infrastructure things that you need. And so there's trade-offs associated with that. So, you know, I f- certainly feel like I've, uh, I've enjoyed uh, both kinds. Um, I think for where I'm at, at at this point in my career, I'm, I'm really enjoying the chance to, you know, work closely with, uh, with the senior team to, to outline the strategy and, and execute and, and set a really high aspiration for doing that and, and feel like, you know, we're well positioned to be able to capitalize on it. So I'm, yeah. I'm really having fun doing that right now. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. And, and when you recruit, you know, obviously a, a lot of folks, you know, will look for different types of characteristics. And, and I know that in my recruiting business, you know, of course, I'm always looking at folks that come from Fortune 50 or Fortune 100 companies, but not everybody can, you know, cross the Rubicon, so to speak, into the middle market. But what, what are the differentiators? You know, if you if you were to look for someone or looking at someone, maybe they're in their 20s or 30s that, you know, is coming into a middle management position that maybe only work for large companies, what, what are the types of skill sets that you think they need to have to be successful in an LK or a, a privately held company of your size? Yeah, I do think um, being able to fairly quickly uh, develop and and outline a vision uh, mm. for the business or function that you're in. Mm. Uh, you know, I think you've, uh, with a company being maybe a little bit smaller, as I said earlier, there really is an opportunity to have impact and to move quickly. Um, yeah. But you got to act on it. Uh, 
Um, and yeah. uh, sometimes you're not going to have the same level of uh, support and infrastructure that you are at a, you know, at a large public company. And sure. so you got to be willing to, um, you know, make that move, make that move quickly, uh, be, you know, have the skill to align uh, people around that vision. Mm. Um, and, you know, also you may have to do, you may have to work a little harder to put in place some of the things around tracking, around uh, execution tools, you know, that might already be in place at a big company. You might have to right. create some of those on your own or, or get help from elsewhere in order to do that. So, I, you know, I think it's being willing to be flexible and, um, uh, articulate that vision and then uh, align what you need uh, around it to, uh, to be successful and going after it. Yeah. When, when you look at your leadership skill set and, and do kind of that same compare and contrast, what, what do you think has benefited you the most in the current setting that you're in? You know, the lessons that perhaps were learned earlier on in your career. You know, I think, uh, I, I've had the, the, opportunity in, in multiple situations in consulting, of course, but, um, mm -hmm also in the other roles that I've been in, uh, to outline a strategy, uh, you know, to really do the, do the hard work to, yeah. um, an analysis and aligning people, uh, and to be really clear, uh, about where you're going. Um, mm. and, and quite honestly, to be focused. Um, you know, I've found, uh, it seems that, that most companies I've seen are oftentimes trying to do too much, um, right. you know, and things that, uh, uh, the, you know, the most important two or three th things sometimes get clouded by, the, the things that aren't the most top, uh, right. you know, the yeah. top two or three. And so, uh, so I, I, I think I've had a skill at being able to outline a, um, a solid strategy, focus around a relatively small set of priorities, try to get people excited about that and inspired, uh, about what we can do with a stretch aspiration, mm -hmm. um, and then putting in place the execution, uh, rhythm, uh, that you need to, to go after that and to be transparent about where you're at and, you know, what's going well and what's not. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, that having had the opportunity to do that in multiple businesses, um, you know, that was one of the things as I came to LK and as I talked with our chairman and our board, uh, we just felt like we were kind of ready for the next chapter mm -hmm. in our long-term strategy. And, uh, that's something that's easy for me to get excited about. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Would you say, Rick, that your leadership style has evolved uh, over the last you know couple of decades that you've been working? And, and if so, how? Absolutely. Uh, I think you're, you know, we're all constantly learning. Uh, every situation mm. is different. Um, one of the things that uh, really became clear to me um, in, in a couple of my early leadership roles was just the importance of, of listening. Um, you know, mm. there's typically such a, a wealth of knowledge in organizations. And I found in, in some cases, maybe people were not uh, in a, uh, a role on the org chart, you know, where they felt right. like they could contribute at that level or um, others had different points of view. But I, you know, a couple of the businesses, I really didn't know uh, a lot about the industry coming into the senior role. And I really had no choice but to, yeah. uh, but to listen. Uh, and yeah. um then I'm, you know, I, I, I feel like at that point I can do a fairly good job of connecting the dots and, you know, beginning to articulate the strategy and direction, as I said earlier, but, uh, but it really starts with that listening. I've just, I've seen the importance of that. So I, I think that's one element of my style that's, uh, that's definitely evolved over time. Yeah. Awesome. You, you talked a little earlier about the importance of company culture and, and how in the middle market that's so unique. And I mean, we've seen that in our practice as well. And, you know, family owned businesses in particular tend to have an imprint of those founding family members. How would you describe the LK manufacturing culture and, 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 and how do you continue to keep that alive and, you know, promulgate that with your, with your growing, you know, operations and staff? Great, great question. And again, something I, I definitely spent a lot of time uh, thinking about before I joined LK and, and since I joined LK. And, you know, as you said, as a, as a uh, long time uh, private family owned business, um, you know, I, I'd say the thing that comes up uh, very consistently as part of our culture, and we really try to live it, uh, is that our strength is in our people. And it's something, yeah. you know, it's simple, um, but we really try to live it. We we try to live that with investing in people, in their development, uh, about being honest with people, mm. uh, about where they're at and, and, you know, where they're excelling and where they can improve, um, trying to be collaborative and supportive uh, of our people so that uh, uh, we try to make it a fun place to work um, where you, you actually enjoy spending time with your colleagues and, and, and want to uh, be on a team with them. Uh, and so we 
we really try to pay a lot of attention to that. And, and again, it's, um, you know, it's easy to put on your website, but we, yeah. we really try to, we try to measure how we're doing that through surveys and, and uh, discussions that we have with our people. Um, and to your point on how you instill the culture, we actually yeah. just took a formal step of a culture steward program. Oh, cool. And we have a few uh, values that are always part of our culture. And we actually, uh, have specific assigned leaders who serve as culture mm. stewards wow. and uh, it's their responsibility to you know really get behind um, you know each of our values uh, and we kind of rotate those uh, so you can focus on one at a time uh, and then have discussions within their teams about what does that mean what are the examples cool. of how we try to live it um, and then again survey around that so that we can see how we're doing so that's a formal yeah. step that we've taken um, now that, and just uh, curious on that do you do you um, are, are people from are they just in the HR organization or are they come from all different disciplines how, how do you kind of appoint those cultural stewards no, the uh, the human resources uh, team, of course, organizes this whole right. program for us. But it, it's managers in the businesses and functions uh, that serve as cool. the stewards, because you know those are the people that uh, are leading their teams every yeah. day. And so, day. Right. Um, so we we really dedicate uh, the time to that. And and uh, you know, I'd say we also. Uh, I'd say we hold each other accountable. I mean, if we're mm. having a discussion and trying to make a decision, it wouldn't be unusual, uh, you know, to hear someone say, well, I don't think we should go this way because that's just not who LK is. That's yeah, not consistent yeah. with our values. And those are the kinds of things that people are comfortable uh, challenging each other on uh, because yeah. that culture is so important to us. So many of our guests and, and, you know, many of them are middle market CEOs like yourself, you know, talk about that importance of culture. And, and I always like to ask the follow up question, which is how, then how do you match that? You know, how do you really interview it? Because it's so hard, so very hard in a 45 minute or one hour interview, or even if you just spend a lot of time with them or multiple folks is really trying to understand, OK, are these folks going to fit in? How do you get to that, Rick? It's, it's, uh, it is a challenge. I think you're right. It's, uh, you know, if you could spend a, a week with somebody, you know, you'd probably get it right. And <laughs> right, to right. your point, if you're spending 45 minutes, it's, it's a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we, when we interview, we do try to emphasize that this is, um, this is something that's really important to us. We really think we're differentiated on this. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I encourage people to, and then I'll share the values and, and, and culture with them. And, um, really invite them to assess if that fits for them as well. You know, I think because yeah. there's assessment yeah. going on both sides and um, I feel like that is, uh, that's effective. And then, you know, you kind of see when you, um, when in the course of an interview, a lot of times we'll have questions about culture and, you know, how would mm. you handle a certain situation? Right. And I think right. when we, focus that much of it, uh, in a discussion, it becomes clear, uh, that this is, you know, really going to be how we're going to work every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think, mm -hmm. you know, people, uh, will, will recognize the importance of that and they may want to select into or not select into, uh, mm -hmm. that culture. So I, you know, I think that's the, that's probably the part that, uh, where we, we just try to put it front and center and, you know, it's not a, it's not a token mention. It's something that we really yeah. try to focus on. Yeah. What else do you look for, Rick, when you're, you know, making bets on the people that you want to invest in and hire? You know, I think, uh, you know, I guess we call it grit. Uh, uh -huh. You know, right. someone who is, uh, you know, of course, you, everybody wants, you know, smart people who are good leaders, who are collaborative and team players. And, um, you know, you also want a certain toughness. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, right. a, it's a challenging uh, business environment for everybody. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. you know, can you be flexible? Can you go a different direction when things don't work. Um, so I think grit is one of those. I'd, I'd say humility um, mm. is really important. Again, you know, none of us have all the answers. And so when you recognize that and you're willing to learn from others and, and you know, connect the dots in different ways, uh, I, I think that's really effective uh, for leaders as well. Um, and then, you know, I, I mentioned this a bit before, but, uh, you know, to me, being collaborative is just a really critical yeah. part yeah. of being a good leader. It's, right. it's how you... It's how you improve. It's how the team gets to, to the best answer. It's it's how you uh, do create that that strong uh, element of culture uh, because people want to work together and they respect yeah. each other. And and so yeah. uh, I think you can pick up on that pretty quickly in in a few conversations. Do you have a favorite interview question, Rick? Um, you know, I I try to get around, um, you know, either greatest lessons learned. 
uh, because right, right. you know that can be uh, a very revealing question. Um, yeah. You know, and and uh, typically leads to a, some sort of a story of their yeah, business the why behind it. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, right. here I thought it was going this way, and it went somewhere yeah. else. And you can right. pick up on a lot of that. Uh, so the things I just mentioned, the the grit, the collaboration, uh, the humility. Um, it, it'll come through in an example like that. Right. Right. Well, Rick, you've been very generous with your time, but we always ask one last question of all our guests, and that's what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone that, you know, maybe has their eyes on the corner office or the C-suite and, you know, has some, you know, maybe some ideas about how to get there, but uh, to benefit from your knowledge and your experience, what would you tell them? Well, Brad, I'd tell them, uh, first of all, I'd say aim high. Um mm. You know, one of the, the things that was shared with me uh, one time that uh, that has stuck with me is uh, the problem uh, for most people and most organizations uh, is not that they aim too high and they miss it. Yeah. Uh, it's that they aim too low and they make it. Um, <laughs> right. And, you know, I'd rather try for a 10 and, and get a nine and a half than try yeah. for a five and get a five. And so I think that really translates into people's own personal development. Um, aim high, you know, set a high aspiration. Uh, I find that's what inspires people. Um, you know, people don't get excited about mediocre uh, aspirations. They get excited about stretch aspirations. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think aim high. Um, try to, especially early in your career, broad learning is really important. Uh, there's so many different aspects to business that the more experiences you can get, uh, the richer uh, mm. your, your thinking and more complete uh, your thinking and experience will be. Um and then again, it inspire your people to be yeah. their best and reward them for it. Yeah, bring them out. Great. Well, Rick Phillips, President and CEO of LK Manufacturing, thank you so very much for sharing your journey into the corner office. Thank you, Brant. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.